Thank you. Good evening. This is the call. My name is Lee and I'm calling the July 20th, 2021 Board of Trust annual monthly meeting of the Board of the Library Trustees of the Wilmette Public Library. All the notices have been distributed and posted. And so I would be meeting remotely for the last time with our director, Anthony Austin, in place at the library. And there are going to be some changes uh, from the last meeting. Uh, Director Austin will be doing the roll call and the votes. And I will be, motions can be seconded because we thought it was confusing when we looked at people flipping and flopping and then we read the parliamentary procedure book. So there will be seconds and then I will be voting because I had some discussions with people. So we are a small board, but I will always be voting last. So can we have the roll call? Yes. Thank you. Trustee Barshas. Trustee Barshas, I see you. Can you hear us? All right, I will come back to Jan. Um, Trustee Fishman. Here. Trustee Nealon is absent. Trustee O'Keefe. Here. Trustee Riddle. Here. Trustee Summer. Here. And Trustee McDonald. Here. And I see that Trustee Barshas is reconnecting to her audio. Um, I'll also note that I'm seeing a number of members of staff. I see John Risco, Kim Hegland, Patsy Devono, Marty Belfontaine, Gail Justman, and Jessica Thompson, and Marcus Levy. I'm also seeing um, Georgia Gebhardt from the League of Women Voters. I see Mary Lawler and Renee Cox. Um, Trustee Barshas, can you hear me? All right, I see that she is present. She's just not, her audio must not be functioning. Um, Jan, when, when your audio does come back, um, just announce yourself so that we, we can tell that you're there. Okay. Um, okay, good. At this time, we are open to public comment. Is there anyone that wishes to address the Board of Trustees? And this is the time to do so. And you can, okay. Being that there is no, we will move on to redraft of the minutes from June 14th, 2021. They were sent out. No comments were received. So may I have a motion to move approval of the minutes? I so move. I motion. Okay. So Jan is checked in. So Jan and then Tracy, you can second it. Jan, do you want to do your motion? Um, I motion, let's see, what am I doing here? <laughs> I motion to accept the minutes of the last meeting. Okay. I second the motion. Okay. It's been moved by trustee Barshish to move approval of the minutes of the regular meeting of June 14th, 2020 presented. If that's okay, if I re-edit that to the and sure. it's been seconded by uh, Trustee Summers. Do you want to do just a roll call? Trustee Certainly. Director. Thank you. Trustee Barshas? Yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Nealon is okay. absent. Trustee O'Keefe? I need to abstain as I was not present. Okay. Trustee Riddle? Yes. Trustee Summer? Yes. And Trustee McDonald? Yes. At this time, uh, we will turn it over to uh, Trustee Summer to go over the treasurer's report. Uh, good evening. Uh, everyone received a copy of the notes to the financial report prepared by John and Anthony, as well as a copy of the financial statements for the year ending June 30th. Um, there aren't a, I, it does, I'll first ask, does anyone have any questions on the, those? And I'll go over, I'll go over a couple of things. One is um, in the check detail, the very last item was, if anyone noted, there was a third payroll. Uh, it's a small one and it really has to do with a small bonus to those 
employees who worked on the RFID uh, project. Uh, and the last thing is the very last line of the words of the wording talks about the fiscal year with an estimated net loss of 496,000. Just note that that includes um, the operating account as well as the expenditures for the capital reserve fund. So it's not like the operating account operated at a loss of 500,000. Okay. Does anyone have any questions on the narrative or any of the checks, the financial statements or the checks or disbursements? I do not. All right. No, thank I, you, Tracy, for doing that. But I had the very yep. first question too. So okay. that, I'm glad you explained that. Great. Um, if there are no questions, I move approval of the bills and salaries for with the salary check detail for June 2021. I'll, I'll second. Is there a second? Okay. Trustee Fishman will second that. Okay. Can you do the vote, Director Austin? Yes. Trustee Barshus. Yes. Trustee Fishman. Yes. Trustee Nealon is absent. Trustee O'Keefe? Yes. Trustee Riddle? Yes. Trustee Summer? Yes. And Trustee McDonald? Yes. At this time, I'm going to let Director Austin introduce Andrew Kim. And you've all received the report that was uh, looking at 20 year financial projection model. And I know it's been suggested by the league and some others and it accompanies our uh, it looks at our capital plan for 20 years and it's a nice compliment to that well on putting us on look at our strategic plan as well to document our budget and what we levy and everything else so director austin Thank you, uh, Lisa. I appreciate that. Um, that's pretty much everything that I was going to say by point of introduction for Andrew. Um, as you know, we've had this conversation about um, trying to improve our financial planning documentation and to supplement our long range planning documents um, that we've completed in the last year, including our 20 year capital reserve study that was completed in August of last year, as well as our plans to update um, our special reserve fund plan, which is also on our agenda this evening, um, incorporating all the data from that. And so in order for us to have a better uh, picture of what our financial future looks like, um, we have engaged with uh, PMA to conduct the study for us and to help us project into the future what we can expect in terms of our levy uh, for our general fund expenditures, as well as our special reserve fund. So um, Andrew, I'm going to turn it over to you. And um, I've got a slideshow here that I'm going to help um, illustrate um, uh, Andrew's document that is part of attachment two of the packet. Um, for those who are following along at home. Um, attachment two is um, the long range financial projection document. All right, thank you, Andrew, for joining us. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's been a pleasure working with both Anthony and John to uh, study the, the library's finances and uh, create this model. Um, Anthony, are you gonna uh, post the presentation to the Zoom? Awesome. There we go. Uh, thank you very much. So yeah, um, I will just uh, provide a brief introdu introduction into uh, our firm PMA, kind of who we are, a little bit of history about what we've been doing for the last 35 years. And then we'll go right into the model that was um, created in coordination with uh, uh, Anthony and John. So uh, next slide. Uh, one more. There we go. So uh, PMA, um, we have been around for 35 years providing financial services of various types to units of local government. We, um, we almost exclusively work with units of government. We did acquire a very small firm uh, this past year and that firm does a little bit of, of financial services to um, private companies and high net worth individuals. So, we can't say that we exclusively work with uh, units of government, but that is certainly our bread and butter and really where we built our, our reputation over the last 35 years. Um, there are three different firms um, within the PMA companies. Um, 
Uh, I work in uh, the public finance department, which is under PMA Securities. Um, and uh, you know, we have offices throughout the, uh, throughout the country. Um, public finance has offices in Illinois, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. As a firm, we are headquartered in Naperville, Illinois. Um, and you know, public finance, uh, the work that we do is mostly specific to bond issues and um, providing uh, advisory services to units of government as they look to issue bonds. And you know, that um, uh, the work that we do with units of government really provide an opportunity for us to create this financial projection model. Because as you might imagine, a lot of units of government as they're looking to issue debt, they want to be sure that they're able to finance the, uh, the debt payments moving forward into the next 10, 15, 20 years, whatever it might be. So that's kind of um, the context in which the financial projection model that we'll be reviewing tonight was born out of. Uh, next slide. So as a, a public finance department, um, yeah, uh, we have 20 individuals in our department, uh, again, based, uh, based in Naperville, Illinois, but with, with offices in Wisconsin and Minnesota. And we did open a satellite office in Fairview Heights as well, which is down um, right outside of St. Louis, uh, of course, within the Illinois border. Um, and so <clears throat> as financial advisors or municipal advisors, you may have heard those terms, we, uh, we work with a vast, uh, vast, you know, a, a wide variety of units of government, including libraries, park districts, municipalities, school districts, uh, community colleges, um, counties. So we have a, a pretty deep familiarity with the way uh, that, um, you know, finances within the state of Illinois are done. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so uh, as I mentioned, the, the the financial projection model, or the model as we'll call it, um, was, was born out of a sense of need for some model to um, project finances for, for the future for units of government in Illinois. Um, and it was originally the model that we'll be looking at tonight in its original form. We have since adapted it and kind of evolved it, but it was originally created for the Palatine Public Library District because they wanted some advice regarding um, a potential referendum that they were, uh, that they were pursuing, which um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that referendum, but that, that did succeed, I think it was in 2019. Um, and so uh, they had originally engaged a different firm um, in order to create a, a model and to provide financial advisory services for a bond issue that they were pursuing. Um, that firm left the market, left the Illinois market. Some of the senior people in that firm retired and they just weren't really able to kind of continue their presence within the Illinois market. And so um, they brought in PMA to kind of fill those shoes. And, you know, we did take a look at the, uh, the, the projection model that the other firm had created. And we realized that there were a lot of holes missing because their model really didn't capture the, the very um, complex nuances of the levy process that is distinct to Illinois. Um, you know, they, they basically uh, said, well, prop let's just assume property taxes uh, increase by, I forget what the percentage they use, maybe two, two, three percent every year for the next 20 years. Well, if you're at all familiar with the levy process in Illinois, it's, it's far more complex than just assuming it might increase. Um, you have various factors like your EAV, the limiting rate, whether or not um, there's a TIF district in the, uh, in the boundaries of the library district, and, and the impact of new property. Uh, all of these factors, CPI, of course, is a big one. Um, and even the way that Cook County distributes its taxes is, is important to understand because it could, it does impact uh, how the revenue is recorded into your um, financial books. So the model that we created takes into account all of these nuances that are you know, very unique to Illinois. Um, and so in that sense, we were able to build a, a far more robust model than um, some of our competitors might have out there. Um, since then, we've utilized this model uh, for the Lyle Library District as well. Um, and they have, a, they have a bond issue coming up later this year uh, that was incorporated into the model. 
um, as well as various park districts in the Chicago land area. Next slide. So we'll just jump into the model here. And I do want to um, throw out a couple of disclaimers um, before we kind of get into the nitty gritty. First of all, um, the one thing I can tell you about this model is that it is wrong and it will be wrong. And the reason for that is because um, like any model, we have to use assumptions uh, because we don't know what, um, what might happen in the future. The model incorporates, for example, CPI. Um, we cannot predict what CPI will be uh, every year for the next 20 years. It incorporates um, how the, the, essentially the real estate market will do and, and how uh, the EAV of the district will grow. We cannot uh, predict the growth of the EAV. Um, in, in fact, in some years it may not grow uh, and it could go down, uh, which is what uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with back in the 2008, 2009 financial crisis happened to EAVs <clears throat> throughout Illinois and I'm sure throughout the country. Uh, so the one thing that I can say is that it is wrong. <laughs> Uh, having said that, it does provide um, a good guideline to projecting out uh, the district's finances over the next um, 20 years, I believe. Uh, the, the other comment I'd like to kind of disclaimer I'd like to make is that um, this is really an evolving document, right? And so as some of these assumptions uh, become reality as time passes, we can update the model to make sure that um, it's reflecting where the library is at a particular time. Um, so, uh, you know, all, all that to say, you know, you may see some numbers here that are, uh, you know, that might force you to, to kind of look twice at it. Um, but, you know, I don't want you to be alarmed at anything because again, this is a model that will continually be evolving, um, you know, as, as time moves on. So next slide. <clears throat> Uh, okay, so the, the, the first kind of section of the model, the model really covers three different sections. The first section here is the levy data. The second section is um, the, the impact to the general fund. And then the third section is the impact to the special reserve fund. So we're gonna start off with the levy data here. Um, the kind of first set of, uh, of numbers there has to do with the EAV. And we do look at, uh, number one, we look at what the library has done historically in terms of its EAV, its new property, uh, the limiting rate that uh, calculates or determines how much the library can extend in, in, in terms of property taxes. Um, and it also incorporates new property uh, because that amount does impact um, not only your EAV, but how much you can extend. Um, it also incorporates CPI. Now CPI is very important because the library district is subject to the property tax extension limitation law, PTEL. Um, so what that says is regardless of what happens with EAV, the library district can increase its extension for the current year uh, based on CPI uh, over and above what it extended in the prior levy year. And then when the library receives its bucket of um, property tax collections, uh, then the library is going to kind of allocate all of those funds, uh, all of those dollars, property tax dollars to the various funds. Uh, and so you can see here uh, the, the levy information shows how the li library is allocating the property taxes that it collects to these various purposes. So number one, we have a corporate, um, we have IMRF, we have social security, we have auditing, and we have liability insurance. Corporate is really just for um, all the dollars that come in from property taxes that go toward the library's general fund. So really for any kind of uh, major operating purpose, uh, the the library can use uh, those dollars for those operating purposes. Um, you know, I, I would say that libraries in, in Illinois are somewhat unique uh, in terms of units of governments um, because you do rely so much of your operating revenues. Uh, your operating revenues are 
very reliant on property taxes. Uh, you know, park districts, they can run various programmings. Um, and so they can generate revenue outside of their property taxes. Uh, cities and towns, they have sales tax revenue or uh, water and sewer fees or stormwater fees that they can impose onto their, uh, their constituencies. The library, for the most part, has property taxes that, that generates really uh, a large bulk, a large significant, uh, significant number of the uh, significant percentage of the library's revenues. And so that's why the, li the levy data that we're showing here is so important for projecting the library's finances. Um, so I'll take, I'll take one step back. Um, if you uh, look, for example, at one of the two highlighted numbers, there's 3.5%. And that's the CPI for levy year 2022, um, which uses calendar year 2021 CPI. We are obviously in uh, calendar year 2021 right now. Um, and so we don't know yet what CPI for calendar year 2021 will be, although we do, do know that number through June 30 of 2021. And through June 30th, 2021, that number is currently at 4.2%. So you might think that 3.5% is a little bit conservative and admittedly it is on the conservative side. Um, I will add that, uh, you know, I was internally going back and forth between using three and a half percent or something larger, maybe closer to four or even 5%. Um, if I had to, if I had to bet money, I would say that I think CPI will reach around um, 5%, but um, I've, I have heard other theories that uh, the later months of the year will experience deflationary pressures. And so even though we're at 4.2% right now, as of June 30, there's, there's um, no guarantee that it'll stay at that level for the remainder of the year. And since some prognosticators, some economists are predicting that there will be deflationary pressures throughout the rest of the year, I thought it would be a, a smarter, more conservative decision to scale that back from 4.2% down to 3.5%. And the reason why that's so important is because the number that we use for CPI throughout the um, projection model uh, has a compounding effect. And so um, if you are, um, if we're gonna be wrong and we're gonna be wrong because we're too aggressive, we, we're, we're thinking four or five or 6%, um, that has an impact for every year throughout the model. And that will grossly overstate the library's uh, revenue generation abilities for the next 20 years. And we didn't want to do that. What we'd rather do is err on the side of being too conservative, put a lower CPI number in there, and um, you know, make sure that the compounding effect of CPI doesn't grossly overstate the revenue generating capability of, of the library. Um, the other number that's highlighted there is uh, the EAV number for levy year 2020, which um, you would think would have been determined by now. And in most years, um, it, it would have been determined by now, but for some reason, Cook County is being very slow with uh, providing this number. And therefore we do not yet have, even though we're in July of 2021, we do not yet have the 2020 EAV. And so that number is, um, is a projected number. It is not, not a, an actual number. <clears throat> um, so, um, Andrew, uh, can I interrupt you for one second? Sure. Um, I've got a, a question from uh, Trustee Riddle. She just would like a little bit more elaboration. Um, we've talked about the consumer price index. There's a few acronyms on this page that some folks may not be as familiar with. So um, EAV, yeah. equalized assessed value, um, when we're waiting for that number, by the way, Cook County did notify me that on July 26th, we should receive that figure so we can update this document when we receive that information. Um, but okay. also the impacts, um, obviously any of these lines that we put in here are gonna have a cascading effect across multiple years, as you stated. So um, mm -hmm. can, you, can you briefly explain what the limiting rate and the reassessment rates are and how that affects, um, there's a 10%, as we can see there, uh, projected for um, fiscal year 24. Can you just briefly yeah. explain that for, for folks at home? Sure. So the, uh, the reassessment rate is essentially the rate at which your, the real estate in the library's district, uh, district is reassessed um, from year to year. 
Now, the way that Cook County does it, so in other words, as um, real estate valuations increase, uh, then you would expect your EAV to increase. And um, so the, the reassessment rate is really measuring the rate at which your EAV is increasing. <clears throat> Um, now, the reason why you'll, you'll see that um, for the projected years, for levy year 2020 and beyond, we have 1%, 1%, 10%, and then back down to 1%. And the reason why is because the way the EAV is uh, assessed on an annual basis, it's done by the county assessor. Um, and Cook County chooses to reassess their property uh, every three years. So in Cook County, we have a triennial reassessment model. And um, there's like basically the, the South, South Cook County gets reassessed in one year. The city of Chicago gets reassessed in the following year. And then Northern Cook County essentially gets reassessed in the third year. Um, and so for the years in which there is no reassessment, we assume a very, very little change in EAV. So um, if you look back historically, um, in 2016, it was a reassessment year for the district. And so you saw a fairly significant increase, 23, 24%. And then for the next two years, we saw very minimal change in either direction for the district's EAV. Uh, and because that's, uh, those years were not reassessment years. And then in 2019, it was another reassessment year and you're back up to about 8%. And so, we wanted to kind of follow that pattern as we were projecting out um, EAV assumptions for the future. So that's why uh, not only on this slide, but on the next two slides, you'll see that pattern recurring um, for the duration of the model. Now, the limiting rate, it's a little bit, um, well, the limiting rate essentially calculates the, um, the extension, which is the, the dollars that the library is, um, uh, asking its constituents to pay or requiring its constituents to pay um, as a percentage of the EAV. So, um, for example, in levy year 19, the extension was $5.59 million and the EAV was $2.62 uh, $2, $2 million. $62 million. Um, and so the limiting rate was 0 0.272 uh, we, we say it's 27 cents because it's going to be 27 cents per hundred dollars of the EAV. Um, and it's just a, a way to measure um, the, uh, the magnitude of the, the taxes you're extending to your constituents. Um, and, I, and I do make a distinction between what you tax and what you collect because, or uh, what, I'm sorry, what you extend in property taxes and what you collect in property taxes because um, while those numbers are very similar, they're actually not exactly one and the same, only because um, some people don't completely pay their property taxes. Um, not, and it's not necessarily because they're irresponsible or they're even financially incapable of doing so, they might appeal their property taxes because they don't think that the amount that they're being asked to pay is accurate. Um, and because of that, your collections are not always 100% of your extensions. And, uh, and I, only bring that up, I only bring that up because we actually take that into account for the general fund section, which we'll get to later. Um, yeah, the, uh, you'll see the new property there as well. Um, you know, we, we do, our model takes into account TIF expirations and TIFs are tax increment financing districts. Um, you, you may be familiar with those, but those are actually put in place by the underlying municipality that overlaps with the, um, with the library district. So in your case, it would be the village of Wilmette. The village of Wilmette could, if they so ch chose, um, establish a, a tax increment financing district. They do not have one. And therefore that line is essentially inconsequential to, um, to the library. But um, we do take into account new money, or I'm sorry, new property. And we're assuming new property to be $15 million per year um, you know, for the duration of the model. Uh, you can see footnote two there, the past four years of new property have averaged, excuse me, slightly more than $18 million per year. So again, $15 million is a little bit conservative, 
Um, but you can see the most recent year in 2019, the, the new property was even less than $15 million. So uh, I think it, it might be appropriate. Um, I think it's appropriately conservative for that way. Um, are there any um, other questions or, or anything I'm missing on this slide that might be Yeah. I'm going to ask a question. Sure. Um, I'm going to follow up on the question of the. Uh, this is I'm a new I'm a new trustee, so I'm still getting my head around the the limiting the. You you mentioned something with the 2018 number and uh, the EAV. Can you explain that one more time again? You were talking about the amount of the levy compared to the EAV. I think it's something to do with the limiting of. The limiting rate? The amount of the extension? Yeah. 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 So you can see, um, so for, let's take, just take a look at levy of 2019. The total cap extension, which is really the, the total extension of the library, is $5.59 $5 million. It's actually the exact same in both levy of 18 and levy of 19. So maybe that's why it's causing a little bit of confusion. Um, but I was looking at the $5.59 $5 million from levy of 19. If you um, divide that number by the EAB, which is two billion sixty-two million dollars, um, you should get zero point two seven cents. Does that does that work out? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So then, uh, if we can move to the next slide. Um, it's, it should look pretty familiar to you, right? It's, it's basically the same thing, except it's projecting out um, on, on this slide through 2032, um, uh, uh, fiscal year 2032, I should say, levy year 2030. Um, and then the next slide um, goes through fiscal year 2040, levy year 2038. Um, just to provide a little bit of clarity on why those two numbers, those two years differ. Uh, so levy year, uh, let's say, for example, right now we are in levy year 2021. And so at the end of this year, uh, your administration is going to file documents with Cook County that say, we want to levy onto our taxpayers X amount of dollars, however many dollars that might be. And that is considered levy year 2021 taxes. Those taxes will be due from its taxpayers, from your taxpayers in calendar year 2022, right? They're, they're due next year. They have to pay them. And I believe it's March and September is your, the, the distribution kind of cycle for Cook County. Um, so those dollars actually uh, align with fiscal year ending 2023. Actually, the, the, the March dollars that are received in March of 2022 are part of fiscal year ending 2022 finances. And then the September, August, September dollars that are received in August, September of 2022 are part of fiscal year 2023 um, finances. And that's why you see this kind of odd relationship between the levy year and the fiscal year. And what, what essentially we're doing is we're trying to align, um, you know, so that, this, that, that, that dollars that are levied in one year are allocated for appropriately in the right fiscal year. Um, <clears throat> so um, I think we can move to the next section then, the next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. yeah sure. Uh, so are you, in your assumptions of these, Going forward, as you can see, looking at our previous our previous levies for the last like four or five years, they've either mm -hmm. been kept, we've kept them flat. We've not taken them up. So, is, what is your assumption going forward for what we're taking our levies at? Yes, levies? that is a, that is a good question. Yes. So, um, according to the Property Tax Extension Limitation Law, uh, PTEL, which the library is subject to because it's in a tax capped county. Cook County is a tax capped county and therefore all units of government, um, unless you're a home rule unit of government, are subject to PTEL. PTEL 
allows the district to extend taxes um, such that they are greater than last the prior year's taxes uh, by CPI. And that's why CPI is so important in this analysis. So for example, in levy year 2020, we'll say, the district is allowed to, and it doesn't have to, it's allowed to extend what extended what it extended in 2019, levy year 2019, plus CPI. And you did note, Trustee Summer, that the library has um, extended a, a flat levy, right? The, 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 the amount has not increased over the last couple of years. The model assumes that the district will extend what the maximum is allowed to extend based on PTEL, which is gonna be capped by CPI. Um, so, um, yeah. So I, I hope hey, that- yeah. So I just, I just wanna confirm. So what this model, it's just, just for the model purpose, we, you are so you are using the assumption. I think I just wanted of taking the maximum allowed extension each year going forward. Just obviously, this is just the, for the correct. model purposes, correct? Okay. Correct. Yes, that is true. Um, having said that, you know we used except for levy year twenty twenty two. Every other levy year moving forward, we use one point five percent, which is a fairly modest um, conservative assumption for the um, increase in the extension. Okay, so um, I think we can slip, skip ahead to a few slides. So yeah, so this here is just um, uh, some historical numbers on what CPI has been over the past, I think it's like 10 or 11 years. Um, and you know, I, I indicated earlier that for levy year 2022, which uses calendar year 2021 CPI, through June 30 of this year, we're already at 4.2%. Um, you can see that that is fairly outsized relative to where CPI has been in recent years. Um, you know, there have been a lot of theories as to why CPI has been so low over the last decade or so. Um, you know, we hear uh, the Federal Reserve is doing all that they can in order to Kind of create inflation and they've been really struggling um, they've been struggling to do that except for this year um, and uh, so that's why in all future years even though I did use 3.5 percent for levy of 2022 I did bring that or we, we brought that back down to 1.5 percent for future years you know my thought is that there are just a, a lot of uh, macroeconomic deflationary pressures on our economy that I don't think are going anywhere anytime soon so it would really be, uh, yeah, I don't think it would be wise to assume um, a, a CPI number that's you know, much greater than one and a half percent. You can see also that we have the three-year averages. We not only have the actual CPIs from each year, but the three-year averages, uh, the averages for three-year, five-year, and 10 years, um, 2.63, 2.38, 1.87%. This is Trustee Riddle, and this is certainly um, an extraordinary year, as you say, and it will be over the next year. Um, sure. I still see that your three-year, five-year, even your 10-year average is certainly below 4.2%. Um, this is one assumption that you know I've also read up on, read upon prior to this 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 meeting, but. That's one. That's one assumption that I think. I think this is an extraordinary year, and mm -hmm. even in 2012, when we were recovering from some of the um, real estate bubble, and and it, it was not for even it was not at four percent historically. So that that's a little bit high from for me. I know that you consider it conservative, but. Maybe we could revisit that in a, in a later discussion, though, as well. I think it, if, if it gets too long, but sure. Just just one clarifying point: the the four point two percent that we had that I'm showing here on this slide is what the CPI actually is. The what I use for the model um, is three point five percent, which is what Anthony's highlighting right there. Because to your point, um, Trustee Riddle, um, you know, we wanted to be a little bit more conservative than 
than you know where the current level is. Um, so hopefully that um, that gives you a little bit of comfort there. Uh, okay, so I think yeah, so yeah, so this slide here um, is just a graph, a graphical representation of what um, you know, let's call them the orange slides that we were looking at earlier. We're, we're showing. Um, now, I, I will add that this slide only goes out through levy year 2030. And that's because, you know, I just don't want to put so much data in one graph. I, I figured it would, you know, this, this kind of provides the, the pictorial kind of illustration that we're looking for without all the bars and graphs. So, yeah. Excuse so, me, Andrew. Sure. May, may I please ask another question? This um, you touched on the assumption for the new property of fifteen million, which you used. Did you look back more than just the last couple of years? Um, the number seems, again, I'm, I'm new at this. It seems aggressive to do fifteen million for that many years in a row. But but if you look back and you have a more uh, long term look, you may have a better idea on that. Yeah, I did not look beyond the, the four years that I'm showing in the um, uh, in the table there, but I'm, I'm happy to do that. You know, we can look. Uh, yeah, I, I think the the data that's available on the Cook County website, I think, goes back maybe 15 years. So I could probably go go back as far as you know whatever is available on the Cook County website and provide. Um, yeah. Uh, a, 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 an average that inc incorporates a larger data set. You you may be very you may be completely on you know I just just sure. that those extraordinary years but yeah thank you very much. Yep no problem I'm just going to make a note of that. Uh, okay. So um, I think we can move on to the general fund section now. Um, I'll try to pick the pace up a little bit. Um, the, the, essentially the general fund here, um, what we can see at the top is um, the, the growth assumptions that we're using for every year. Um, the, except for that top line that, that has a, a gray highlight, that, represents the fact that um, you know the library only collects a certain percentage of what it extends and so uh, that we're assuming that the library will collect on an annual basis 98 and a half percent of its extension on an annual basis all the other percentages below that show you know what we think the growth rate of each of the revenue and expenditure categories will grow by um, you know throughout the throughout the model so Obviously, we have the historical uh, data, which is what the library has done over the last several fiscal years. Um, and then we have numbers projecting forward. Um, let's see. So yeah, the, uh, the investment income is a little bit low, but um, that's really reflecting just kind of what the reality is in the investing world right now. Um, Unfortunately, uh, it doesn't look like the library will be able to earn six figures in investment income, at least for the time being. Hopefully one day it gets back. Right now it's not there. Um, yeah, I will add that uh, there's the one, there's the other highlighted number there. Um, looks like it's, I know it's kind of hard to see. It's like 600,000 um, in fiscal year 2019. Uh, and that's, I only highlighted that because that's going to differ from your audit um, because we're, we decided to allocate some of the expenses that in the audit are allocated in the general fund, we decided to allocate it to the um, special reserve fund. Um, you know, and, and the really the, the, the one item I wanted to highlight on this uh, can I, I just, I'm, I know we're, we're kind of, we're taking a lot longer here than, than um, I think we had intended to, but I wanted to just add a clarifying point to that item that we just discussed there. Um, in in uh, fiscal year 19, we were doing the outdoor renovation project. Um, it is unclear to um, uh, finance manager Risco and I why the audit that year 
um, characterized um, some additional income as part of the general fund, when in fact in QuickBooks, um, that information, uh, th those, those expenditures came from the special reserve fund. Um, what we've done here is we've reflected accurately the way that our, our receipts um, were characterized um, versus uh, the way that, that those numbers are corresponding in the audit. Otherwise, um, the numbers that you're seeing represented here were drawn directly from the audit. That's how Andrew arrived at all this information here. But that is just a note that I want you all to be aware of. Um, we can take that back up with Sickich and see if they can um, make a correction in arrears of that. Um, but I just wanted to, to call that out because um, we did do that confirmation and um, we were right on that information. So just anyway, sorry, Andrew, back to it. Yep. No worries, thanks. Um, yeah, the main thing that I wanted to highlight on this slide is the um, the green and the purple shaded what the uh, ending fund balances are as a percentage of your expenditures. Um, and so obviously looking at the percentage really provides a metric um, to determine how well funded and, and you know, or, or if the, the library's general fund is overfunded. Um, and so it's been running at roughly, you know, 170%, 180% over the last several years. Um, but, uh, you know, many might consider that to be overfunded um, in the general fund. And so the, um, the library instructed me to include a, a $3.7 million, $3 million um, transfer from the general fund to the, uh, I think it's to the special reserve fund in fiscal year 2022. And what you'll see is that when that transfer occurs, it will bring the fund balance down to roughly 100%. Um, and uh, you know, there's still over five and a half million dollars or there still will be over five and a half million dollars uh, in your general fund, which is a, a very substantial number. Um, and so, you know, transferring that 3.75 million uh, really is, uh, seems like a, a wise financial decision for the, for the library. Right. And this is the course correction that we've been talking about in our committee meetings and previous board meetings and uh, reflects the finance policy that the board had adopted in, uh, in March of this year. So I think if you're able to jump ahead a, a couple of slides, Anthony, um, Thank you. You'll see at the very end of the model, the, um, the fund balance shows 30% of expenditures, roughly two and a half million dollars, which would be at that time, 30% of your um, expenditures, which is still uh, by many measures, a very healthy fund balance. Um, and so of course, in order to get to that, uh, that 30% fund balance, we did create intentionally a structural deficit so that the library is kind of spending more um, in order to get that fund balance down than spending more than it's receiving in order to get that fund balance down. And that, that is by design. Um, I think we can go to the next slide. So I uh, just wanted to show some history regarding uh, the the library's expenditures over the last you know, five years. Um, the, the bulk of the general fund expenditures are related to personnel services. So the, the year over year change here, the data that I'm showing here includes both the personnel services, the salaries, as well as total operating expenditures. And you can see how that has kind of changed from year to year. Some years it's actually gone down a little bit um, and in some years it's, it's gone up, you know, several percentage points. And then of course we have the three year and the five year averages for those changes. Um, and then graphical representation of that data as well. <clears throat> uh, next slide. And then uh, this is a, um, a graphical representation of the general fund uh, revenues, expenditures and fund balance. Again, this is just showing what we laid out in numerical detail on the earlier slides. The fund balance is designed to go down to roughly 30% by the end of the, uh, the model. So next slide. 
So the last section of the model is the special reserve fund. And um, the, this, this section of the model was really um, created using the, I think it's the Engberg Anderson study that uh, the library had done in order to uh, address capital expenditures that might occur over the next uh, 20 years or so. So um, this model incorporates all of the planned expenditures that Engberg Anderson suggested the library pursue. Um, you can see it also includes the transfer from the general fund of 3.75 million, which will occur in fiscal year 2022. Um, and I believe it did also include a couple of anticipated expenditures that were not included in the Engberg Anderson study that um, Anthony and John are aware of and, and want to make sure that we're accounting for it in the model. And Andrew and Anthony, is that number six? Um, I believe it's number six. Is that in in is that noted? Are the details of that capital outlay noted in um, information we've received? The $3 million estimate for the renovation project that's listed in fiscal year 24 is reflected in the document that's included in our board packet as the special reserve fund plan. And this is characterized, has been historically characterized as the renovation of the first and lower level, um, a topic that we've discussed um, at previous board meetings over the, the past several years. And that is the estimate using current construction costs and uh, benchmarking other projects that are currently in progress. Um, Shales McNutt helped to provide that information to us. Thank you. Yeah, you know, the only other revenue that's really coming to the special reserve fund, uh, in addition to any transfer from the general fund, would just be investment income um, from the fund balances in the special reserve fund. And so you can see there that you know, that drops significantly. Again, we're being very conservative with um, investment returns moving forward. Um, and so the, the rest of this, uh, the next two slides or this slide and the next slide just show the, the projection of the special reserve fund through uh, fiscal year 2040. Um, So Andrew, as a, as a point of, uh, of detail here on this last page, this model, if I'm reading this correctly, in fiscal year 2035, um, we would show a deficit in the special reserve fund, um, even though that we've got planned expenditures that would take us through the next five, six fiscal years. Is that correct? Correct. Yep. Correct. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and of course, you know, the way that you're going to address that is um, through general fund transfers at some point in the future. Um, you know, the earlier you start making general fund transfers um, to the special reserve fund, the smaller those annual amounts have to be. The later those transfers start occurring, the larger those annual amounts will have to be. And, um, but again, you know, this model is intended to be, uh, tend intended to go through evolutions as time moves on just to adjust and to adapt to what has actually happened. So I think we can go to the next slide. Again, a graphical representation of what the special, the special reserve fund will look like uh, over time. And then the last slide, I believe, is just a sensitivity analysis. So, you know, if, for example, uh, in the revenues of the general fund, if, if CPI changes by 0.1%, what kind of impact would that have on revenues in the general fund would be roughly $5,700. Um, if new property changes by a million dollars, what impact does that have? Roughly $2,500. And for expenditures in the general fund, if we assume a growth assumption of, a change in the growth assumption of 0.1%, that would impact expenditures by $5,400. So I think that's the, uh, that's the completion of the model and the presentation.
just one quick question. We've always, sure. because you can uh, levy taxes based on the CPI over the CPI, mm -hmm. we've always been told that you've got to be careful about backing yourself when we were looking at levying the taxes, you know, that you had to be careful that if you kept it low for like, or didn't levy for like three years or kept it low, you would be unable to levy. So that's not correct then if it's tied to the, what the CPI is. Is that correct? And Anthony, you may uh, be able to elaborate what I'm saying, but that's, you know, that was always floating around where we have to. Yeah, so I th what I think um, mm -hmm. Trustee McDonald is asking is, um, the, the library has reduced its levy in, in the last several years. Um, we've held it flat for the last couple of years, but prior to that, we did, we did do two reductions. And we were cautioned against doing further reductions um, because um, we lose the ability to capture um, the highest year of our last three years worth of, um, of levies if we reduce it past a certain time frame. Um, that we would then have to go for a referendum in an effort to try to recover um, any of yeah. the uh, revenues that we had left on the table essentially by the reductions. Does that make sense? Yeah, that is that makes sense and is, is also true. So um, you can go back to the highest point in the last three years. When you take the CPI increase, you can go back to the highest point over the last three years as long as um, there was a reduction in the past year. So in terms of the model, you just did what you thought was best in terms of, so that none of that was factored into it as to, are there yeah. any, if it drops Correct. below a certain point, is this gonna be done annually? Anthony, do you see this projection doing being done annually or every three years? So that if some of these assumptions don't play out, you know, I think, you know, we can certainly make adjustments to the document as we move forward. I don't know that it's necessary to, to conduct this deep of, an, of a dive on an annual basis, but it's certainly a model that we can return to on a regular basis. Yes. Okay. So you do you have the ability to do it in-house in terms of changing some, you know, the inflation and that type of factor? Does it have to go back out? Uh, this information is proprietary. Um, but uh, we certainly got a partner in PMA um, with Andrew here um, to, okay. to maintain this going forward. Okay. Are there any other questions from the board? Andrew, you've been very generous with your time tonight. Thank you. Sure, absolutely, it's my pleasure. So um, obviously um, team, if you've got any further questions, um, you know, if you wanna take some time to review this information, get back to me. Um, we can, I'm happy to talk it through. John and I are familiar with this model. We can take our questions back to Andrew if we've got anything else. Um, the intent is to use this document um, to help communicate as part of our, our financial planning documents, um, um, all of our long range uh, plans. So um, once we've got this in a position that we feel is we're comfortable with um, in terms of it being, you know, obviously that asterisk there at the bottom of the page is that it's all projected and preliminary and it's subject to change. And there's a lot of assumptions built in, but all of that said, um, there's certainly a strong philosophy and a lot of guiding uh, documents that are behind this information that will um, allow us to help uh, plan accordingly as we, as we move forward. So, um, this can live on our website as part of our planning documentation and our, our library finance page and be supplementary to the other documents that we've got up there. So, all right. Andrew, thank you again. We really appreciate you being here and, and taking us through the model. Yeah, absolutely. It's my pleasure. Um, if you have any questions, just uh, feel free to reach out. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Andrew. You're welcome. At this time, we move to the action items. And the first is ordinance number 2021-22-197, annual and appropriation ordinance for library purposes for the fiscal year 21-22 in tentative form. We approved the budget in June, and this is just a legality in, uh, by the state of Illinois for in terms of the next step, since we've already approved the budget. Director Austin. 
Right. So the um, the um, there's a, a document that accompanies um, the tentative budget appropriation ordinance as a, a narrative overview that provides um, some pretty detailed background about what the purpose of the appropriation is, and um, it provides the methodology for the calculations that you see um, in the appropriation. As Trustee McDonald says, uh, the appropriation um, is essentially the instrument that um, authorizes the library to legally expend the dollars that it receives. Um, and it sets forth a responsible ceiling for the, the expenditures that we reasonably expect to have over the course of the next fiscal year. Um, there are a couple details that we do, um, we do note in this document um, that are maybe aberrations from the, the methodology that we use. So by and large, um, the variance that we may see on any individual line items in our budget in a given fiscal year is approximately 10%. And so that is essentially the model that we use with the appropriation as a 10% um, line by line um, cushion to each of the individual budget items. There are two that we um, typically would, would um, appropriate a little bit more for. Um, one of those is grant income. In the event that the library should apply for a grant and receive that grant, we need to appropriate those funds in order for us to be able to expend them. Uh, so we appropriate a little bit more in the event that we find ourselves with a grant opportunity. The other is um, the employee health insurance. And um, that one is a little bit harder to target because um, that bill comes on a calendar year basis and our fiscal year starts on July 1. So we've only just begun our fiscal year and the employee health insurance line, um, which is fairly substantial at just over 600,000, um, will not, um, we won't have figures for that until the end of the calendar year. Um, so what we, what we appropriate is typically about 10% over what our actual was for the previous year. Um, and that tends to make up the difference. And, um, uh, the, the, the reason there's a bit of an aberration there this year is because we've had a lot of changes in our personnel. We brought on some additional staff. Um, some folks have added dependent coverage. Um, so it seems reasonable that we would um, keep that one as an aberration this year. Um, another detail that's a little bit different with this year's um, appropriation document is the uh, special reserve um, details. Uh, so one, as we just talked about in the PMA model, um, we are appropriating a transfer. Um, again, this document is only to give us the ability to do so. This isn't the document that authorizes us to make a transfer. Um, in fact, the board will have to make a motion um, and create an action item in order to do that change. And um, we're, uh, the library is recommending that the board take that consideration following the receipt of the annual audit for fiscal year 2021 uh, when we received that in October of this year. So anytime after that point, I think it would be reasonable and appropriate for us to align our funding as we've been discussing and make that transfer or whatever we think is a reasonable transfer. I don't think it would be more than that amount, but um, we think that that's probably the appropriate line and that's why that's in the appropriation. The other um, detail regarding special reserve that's a little bit different from what we've done in the past. Historically, the library has appropriated the entirety of the special reserve fund um, as part of the appropriation document. Um, this year, um, I've taken that out and I've only appropriated the lines that we think we would reasonably endeavor within this next fiscal year. Um, so that is why you're not seeing the entirety of the special reserve fund plan in there, just a few select items. Uh, are there any questions or comments about what you're seeing in the appropriation? Uh, Tracy? I have a question, Anthony. Um, you did a good job explaining the transfer. Is that the same thing for the special reserve capital improvements? Those are items that we, we, we if the board approves them, we would do them. It's not by, by approving this appropriations, it doesn't mean we're approving those projects. Is that That's correct? That's correct. Yes, okay. um, the library would need to take um, action individually on those individual projects. And as a number of them have a substantial sum attached to them, the library would likely need to be going out for bid projects on any of those projects that we would endeavor. Thank you. Yep. All right, any other questions or comments on the uh, tentative B&A? No. And next month we'll have a hearing 15 minutes at the beginning of our meeting, which will be 6.30 for the public. And so where they get a chance to talk about or ask, well, just to talk or comment. Yep. 
about it. So that'll happen next month. So is there a motion to move approval? Well, I am sorry, I still did have, I want. I didn't want to interrupt you. This is Maria or Fina Riddle. I still think it's worth having a little bit of review. I mean, it was a lot of information. We just got it on Saturday. I mean, I know you're open, Anthony, is to receiving more questions, but um, I think I think it's a lot to kind of digest right now to vote. I mean, would we want to table this vote by any chance? And after we've had some more discussion or after you maybe receive more questions, Anthony, I don't know if I'm the only one that has outstanding questions today, but I don't I I don't want to slow things down if I'm the only one. Okay, well, for one thing, we have um, we've advertised the um, we, we have we have a deadline to approve this document. This is a formality. Um, there's nothing binding in here. There's no impact to taxpayers. Um, this is merely a um, this is a formality that gives the library the legal ability to expend the money that it has. Um, so there, there, you know, I, I, I think I've set that forth in, in the overview document. I'm happy to address any questions that you have. We've advertised the hearing um, as being on uh, August 17th at our next board meeting. Um, that is a final date. We have to, we have to hold our hearing and approve the BNA that night. Um, you are approving tonight the tentative form of the document as presented. Um, again, this is not a binding document. Uh, the final approval of the of the BNA will be done at the August meeting. And we already approved the budget and had quite a bit of discussion at several meetings. So this is just formalizing that process. And there's a, a lot of background information on the, on the process and um, what the purpose of the document is in the packet. Um, I'm happy to address any questions that you may have at this point, um, any of the trustees. Jan, I see you. Okay. No. Okay. Do, um, do we do we have a motion? Motion to approve the ordinance. Trustee Fishman, I move approval of ordinance number twenty twenty one slash twenty two hyphen one ninety seven annual budget and appropriation ordinance for library purposes for fiscal year. 2021-22 in tentative form. Is there a second? I second the motion. Okay. Is there any additional discussion? It's been moved by Trustee Fishman and seconded to Approval of the ordinance number 2021-22-197 annual budget and appropriation ordinance for library purposes for fiscal year 21-22 in tentative form. Can we have a roll call? Certainly. Austin. Trustee Barshis. Yes. <clears throat> Trustee Fishman. Yes. Trustee Nealon is absent. Trustee O'Keefe. Yes. Trustee Riddle? No. Trustee Summer? Yes. And Trustee McDonald? Yes. The motion passed five yes, one no, and one absentee. Next, we go to the resolution number 2122-22 slash 22-207, amending a plan and estimating costs. The resolution outlines potential long-term capital fund expenditures in the special reserve fund incorporating maintenance projects identified in the 2020 capital reserve study, and it goes 20 years out. Do you have anything that you want to add? Sure. Um, so again, this this document um, we did we, we historically have um, done a renewal of this resolution amending a plan on an annual basis. Last year we were in the process of receiving Ingberg Anderson's um, 20 year capital reserve uh, study plan, and so we held off on doing that um, that update to the document at that time. With that document in hand this year, I was able to um, update the estimates on the individual line items on those figures. 
Um, I did see that a lot of the information we had included in there historically was still accurate. And um, I was also able to then, um, as we said earlier in this call, update the information for line item I, the last item on the, the, um, the document, um, reflecting what our estimates would be for the renovation of the first and lower level um, should we endeavor to do so in fiscal year 24. Um, so I've also been able to walk out some of the expenses that we've had in there historically. Um, having successfully completed the 2019 outdoor renovation project, we've reduced the line item that related to the landscaping and hardscape. However, this is a 20 year plan. And at some point that concrete is going to wear and that landscaping is probably gonna to need to be updated and renewed. So we did keep a little bit um, in there for the maintenance of that, that line item. Um, because we will always have grounds to maintain. Um, the um, RFID project and AMH were historically included in that, and I can say that we're getting close to having finalized that project, and those are some expenses that we can walk out of this plan as well. Um, so those are the details, and it follows uh, the same formula that we have done historically, and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have about the document. Yes, Trustee Summer. I have a question. Um, so this list is fairly, it's fairly extensive. And I looked at the one from 2019. These are, this is, I just want to confirm, this is your wish list. It does not obligate us to the trustees to actually, to, to do that. It gives us, it gives the ability to use a special reserve fund in the future for this if we as the trustees approve the project. Is that correct? Is that accurate? You are, you are absolutely correct. So let me, let, me, as, let me walk this back for one second. The resolution amending a plan, as this document is called, AKA the Special Reserve Fund Plan, the purpose of this document is to reinforce why we have a special reserve. Um, so the purpose that a library would retain a special reserve fund is for the purposes of, at the top of the document, it states there for renovating, repair, there, all kinds of items that are identified in that statute that's listed in there. And that is an addition that we made this year at the recommendation of our attorney who reviewed the document that we include the citation for the special reserve fund so that um, folks can, can go in there and see exactly what we are statutorily um, able to use the special reserve fund funds for. Um, and so essentially what we are doing here is we are saying um, that this is how we would responsibly expend the monies that we have collected in the special reserve fund in an effort to ensure the continuity of services um, related to the infrastructure of the building, the physical capital aspects of the library. Does that answer your question, Tracy? Um, yes, I guess, because I, as a, a new trustee, I just want to preface that, I may not necessarily look at these these things and say, oh yeah, I think we should spend $500,000 on a parking area. I, I don't know enough about that. But what you're saying is I'm not committing as the trustee if I vote yes for this to a $500,000 parking area. I'm saying if in the future, that's something that the board decides that they think that's a good, we have enabled ourselves to do that by virtue of this document. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Also, it's maintenance over time, and I know when it'll go up on the website, he'll link it to that capital project review by Ingberg Anderson, so they can see where those numbers, some of those numbers are based on. Yep. So it's over a 20-year period. It's not like you'll spend 500000 right away. It may be over, who knows what's going to happen. And for any major project, it all has to come before the board. And just to remind you all, I mean, this, I know you can't all see this document here, but within Ingberg Anderson's 20 year capital study, you can see this tall green line that's on the, the far side of my, of my page here is the current project that we're working on right now, the outdoor or the, um, the, the 2021 capital repair project. That's the biggest year of all of our expenses. Um, the rest of everything that you see listed in there is included as one of the other bars going out over the next 20 years. So everything that is included in the document that's before you this evening is drawn directly from Ingberg Anderson's study. For instance, we know that with the roof, it's been warrantied for 10 years, more years, but eventually it's gonna have to be replaced because the latest roof work just warranted, extended that warranty for 10 years. So it's things like that. 
So you this need... is to reflect that you have a responsible plan for the, the funds that you've accumulated, but it does not obligate you to complete that work. It does not authorize you to do that work right now. All of those projects would be done um, as part of a separate RFP, RFQ. Um, there would be a whole process that you would have an opportunity to review and vote upon and make decisions about at a future date. This document does not obligate you to any further action. It just communicates to the public that you have a responsible plan for what you want to do with the funds that you've accumulated. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is Trustee Fishman. I might add that that has having a responsible plan with solid facts and figures, I believe is vital because that answers what our patrons in the past have asked for. So I think putting this up on the website, tying it to the long-term um, planning that we've had, that we've commissioned, is um, being good stewards of the patrons funding that support us. I agree. And I, I agree with the items. Um, on this, on this um, document, I think I what I have questions with, concerns with, is are the outlays the the cost of some of the outlays, the dollar amounts of the outlays. Um, so I think it's of course it's a it's a very manageable list. These are these make sense. They're justifiable legally, and it's just the amounts that I think we could still still revisit and I've, I think I've said that in the past as well. But those were the costs estimated by the capital plan and when you go out to when it when it actually comes up there will be three three or more bids that will go out so and I think most of our projects have come under in the past slightly under what had been estimated. Do you have anything? Uh, but as I recall wasn't this Trustee Fishman their plan has been their proprietary information that that is um, moving forward to estimate costs from now 2021 to 20 years out as costs will change. So the costs we see now, it may be more, it may be less. Look what they've talked about has happened to lumber and so forth over this, only this past year. It was way high. $10 for a two by four. Now that's come back down to what it, about what it was. I, I heard that from uh, those involved in the construction world. So it's, it, and that's the beauty of this document that we have, that there's flexibility. So I, I don't necessarily think, is that correct, Anthony? That these numbers, and you continue to, to list, estimated. So I don't think any of us would feel uncomfortable because it's estimated and certainly those can change. You're some absolutely up, correct. Down. Yeah, and that I think that's a really good example. I mean, I was talking about that with our construction manager today. We're lucky that we um, approved the, um, the project that we're working on right now when we did um, because um, the contractors that we were are under contract right now, right now with us for certain um, labor are subject to what they originally bid on the project, even though the cost of materials may have gone up. Um, so it, there are a lot of variables that go into this. These are estimates. That's why every single one of those items says estimates. Um, yes, it's true that the, the tracking model that was provided to us by Inger, Ingberg Anderson, it has a number of assumptions put in it, just like Andrew Kim's document has a lot of assumptions put into it as well. Um, they're based on trending. Um, but there are obviously aberrations in trending and that's going to, you know, as we get closer to these individual years and individual projects, we'll be looking at those items and you'll have time to scrutinize those and um, we can get into the details as we move forward with that. But this gives us a long range view of, of where we need to go to maintain the building and structure as we move forward. Is there a motion to approve the resolution? Trustee Fishman, I move approval of resolution 2021-22-207, amending a plan and estimating costs. Is there a second? No second. Okay. Trustee, is there any additional discussion? Trustee Fishman has moved to approve the approval of resolution number 20. 
21-22-207, amending a plan and estimating costs. And it has been seconded by Trustee Barshis. Can we have a roll call? Sure. Trustee Barshis. Yes. Trustee Fishman. Yes. Trustee Nealon is absent. Trustee O'Keefe. Yes. Trustee Riddle. No. Trustee Summer. Yes. And Trustee McDonald. Yes. The motion passed. Five yeas, one nay, and one absentee. Okay. Now we're moving it on. So would you like to, Anthony, talk about the capital repair project update? Most definitely. Um, so we've um, we've added a few updates to the timeline on the website. Um, as you know, the library's got a project page dedicated to this project. That's um, one of the four content blocks on the main page of the site. Um, just to give you a, a brief overview of where we're at at this point on the, um, the, the key items of the project. So the masonry and tuck pointing work is 90% complete as of June. The remainder of the work to be completed um, is during the electrical shutdown here in August. I'll get into more detail about that here soon. Um, the masonry and tuck pointing work that needs to be done adjacent to the electrical uh, main as it comes into the building cannot be completed um, unless the masons want to get zapped. So um, the power has to be turned off in order to do that. Um, so this is the first time actually that we're going to be able to conduct the, the uh, tuck pointing around that area of the building because we will be shut down. So that work will be done in August. Uh, the roofing work at this point is 95 complete by the end of July. And um, I believe that we've actually completed all the punch, uh, punch list items on uh, that project. I did get a walkthrough of that today with our um, uh, construction manager and um, the work looks good. And as um, Trustee McDonald noted a little while ago, um, we will be able to renew um, our warranties on all these roofing surfaces that we had updated. Um, it looks really good. And I believe that we're gonna address a number of the water infiltration issues that we had um, prior to this project. Um, the big topic of discussion right now going on is our drain tile work. And so that work is in process. Um, we relocated a number of shelving units on the lower level of the library near the 600s. Um, we've put in a number of protections in that area. Um, we've got some visqueen plastic that's up locking the, the construction zone. Uh, there's masonite down on the floor to protect the floors um, as uh, the crews are moving their material in and out. We've got a dumpster set up on Wilmette Avenue that they're bringing all the spoils and uh, debris out um, to that dumpster. Um, they did saw cutting to remove the concrete floors in that area this week. And um, we discovered that there was an existing drain tile that we were not aware of that was in that place. So we're going to scope that line to see just how effective it is. Um, we are still, that's on, on the south wall, but it's the west wall um, of that area that we're still concerned about. And when the walls came off the wall, we noticed that there was a portion of the wall that's um, CMU, that's uh, um, concrete blocks, basically, um, that uh, we weren't expecting to find there. We thought we were going to find a solid concrete wall, but in instead we found these more porous bricks in that place, which I think has contributed to a lot of the leaking that we've seen in that corner. Um, so to do investigative work, we needed to see what was, what was on the other side of the crawl um, that was behind that wall. So we took out that wall and we discovered that there were a lot of spoils from the construction project that um, put in uh, the newest portion of the building from 87. Um, and um, in the process of that, we, we discovered that there's actually a number of things that we're going to need to do to address that area um, in addition to what we had already discovered. So we have had some uh, a number of, of aspects of our project that have come in under what we were expecting them to be. And I think you know we're probably going to make up some of those um, savings on this aspect of the project, which is obviously one of the key aspects that we wanted to address is the water infiltration has been a serious issue in the lower level for a number of years. So we want to do it right the first time. Um, um, and so we're going to take our time with this one. It's going to take a couple weeks longer than I think we had anticipated. Uh, we're hoping to get all this work completed before the electrical shutdown, because we're not confident that they can get all this work done in the dark. Um, but uh, uh, we have high hopes that we're going to be able to get this, um, this all resolved. Um, 
The other uh, work that's been done demolition-wise this week is the demo of the existing security access control and fire alarm systems. We've been removing um, a lot of the, uh, the wiring for those systems um, over the course of the last week. In fact, previous renovation projects have left a lot of cabling in the ceiling and walls um, that, were un, um, that were no longer being used. Um, so we're doing a, a deep cleanup um, and we're able to clean up a lot of conduit and eliminate a lot of systems that um, you know, are, are 30 and 40 years old that um, have just been crumbling and are no longer in use. So we're thrilled to, to be able to see that um, the only systems that are gonna be um, in the building are actually active systems. And um, there's a lot of improvement that's actually gonna come in the wake of the installation of these new security access control and fire alarm projects that we're working on. Um, obviously the big topic of discussion here and what I'd like to go into a bit more depth with you all tonight um, relates to the electrical distribution work and that's relating to the shutdown. So um, as, as we've talked about, the electrical distribution um, begins um, this last week with the installation of the temporary uh, backup electrical uh, system. Uh, this is what is essentially going to be powering the server and um, some of some core lights basically in the lower level of the library that will help the electricians do their job when they're replacing the main. Uh, mm -hmm. So ComEd has installed this, uh, this temporary system and um, they've lit it up and uh, the village is gonna come by and do their inspection here shortly. And uh, that will mean that we can then make that cut over to that temporary service um, when we're getting ready to shut the, the whole system down in the middle of August. And so that is the big piece. Um, uh, the, the library will um, be under construction for the replacement of its electrical main system and uh, breaker systems um, from August 15 through August 31. And we are going to concurrently be conducting a number of other projects at the same time that are very disruptive as well and would require the shutdown of the library. Um, and th that work involves, um, as I said, the parking lot repairs. Um, with the drive lane of the parking lot requires 10-year maintenance. It's hard to believe, but we are actually right there at about 10 years on this permeable paver parking lot. Uh, the drive lane is rutting, and we've got some separation and broken bricks. And um, since we're going to be shut down for the electrical project, it's a perfect time for us to do this. You may recall that we approved this project last fall. Um, so we've already secured the labor for that, and that crew is ready to roll uh, as soon as we get um, the electrical shutdown. And as I said earlier at the top of this conversation, the masonry is also going to get its finishing touches done at that same time in August. So I want to walk you through a little bit more about what, what is involved um, and why we're doing what we're doing. So as you may recall, in early 2020, we conducted our first major capital needs study that, um, in years, and the resulting report created a 20-year plan for ongoing maintenance of the library building. We've referred to that several times here this evening. That was our engineering firm and um, architects Ingberg Anderson who conducted that report for us. Um, basically, that report included uh, the library's budget. It will be included in our um, budget and planning documents as the 2020 capital reserve study. And it comprises the majority of the library special reserve plan, which we just approved. Um, and both of those documents um, will be uh, located on the library's finance page. I will get that other one up there um, here shortly. So in 2021, the first year of our maintenance plan, we have scheduled the most critical repairs relating to life safety, occupant health, building system integrity, and functional obsolescence. Um, as I illustrated to you with that graph a moment ago, this is the most impactful and involved year of our 20-year uh, maintenance cycle. Um, I can't say with definitive certainty that we are not going to have a shutdown of, of the library over the course of the next 20 years um, for a maintenance project again, but I sincerely feel that this is the most involved system repair that we would be doing that would require that type of work. So this is an aberration. It's not something that we're likely going to be doing anytime again here soon. Um, and uh, so a little bit more about this, this two-week closure here. So why will the library be closed? Um, the two-week closure, August 15 through 31, addresses necessary maintenance work that cannot be completed in an occupied building. The primary reason for the closure is due to the fact that the building will be without electricity. Um, the main electrical service and power distribution throughout the library building is being updated, replaced, and modernized to comply with current standards and to create a safe single disconnection point. That was one of the key elements that was identified in Ingeberg Anderson's study. The original electrical switchboard, branch panels, breaker boxes, end devices, and get this, 
cloth wiring dating back to the 1950s will also be updated and repaired. Um, that cloth wiring, obviously, um, a number of homeowners around this area will, will know full well that that is certainly a dangerous thing and not something that we would want to have in our public buildings. So these are all critical issues that we need to address um, right now. Um, as I said a moment ago, concurrent with this major electrical project, we are, we are performing a number of other tasks in an effort to try to reduce impact to public service. So um, I'm grateful um, for the, the work of our construction manager at Shales McNutt um, for coordinating this work and uh, getting all these trades together to work simultaneously in an effort to keep this to just two weeks, as opposed to, um, you know, this could take a lot longer if we didn't have that level of coordination. So um, that's how we've been able to reduce this to just a two week time frame. And so why? Why right now? Why are we doing this at this very moment? Well, um, ideally, this work could have been done um, during our closure in the pandemic. But as you all know, projects like this um, are very involved. They take a lot of coordination. Um, we received the study in August of 2020, and we immediately got to work. And just now we we're able to complete that work because architects have to create drawings. We have to then review all of that information. We have to go out to bid. Um, we then have to review those bids. The board has to take a vote on those bids. Then we have to get those contracts together. The whole process can take months in order to get even the skilled trades that you've hired to get to start the project. Once all that was settled, we had to look at our calendars and determine when would be the best time to try to coordinate this work. And looking at um, statistical trending for the library, we've noted that the last two weeks of August have historically been the quietest months in terms of our door traffic, as well as our circulation in any given calendar year. Um, this is typically because we've noticed, um, and through anecdotal information, that a lot of folks typically will take one last vacation in the summer before the kids go back to school um, in late August. And uh, we're banking on that this year. Um, and so that is why we have scheduled this particular project to coincide with that time frame. And the fact that we were able to get all these skilled trades to work together um, with our coordinated plan, uh, that is why uh, we've been able to do this. The good news is that over the course of this last pandemic year, um, we've got a little bit of experience with still being able to maintain some level of customer service um, to the community, despite the fact that our building was closed. The, the one aberration that we do have from that original plan that we've been doing over the course of the pandemic year is the fact that um, we won't have access to the building at all. So um, material circulation is gonna be the key challenge to us. Our book drops will need to be closed because staff can't use the building. They can't collect, distribute, sort those materials. They can't check them in. We don't have a mechanism to do all of that over the course of that brief two week time. So um, we're partnering with some of our neighboring libraries. We have a plan up on our website um, for, for patrons to be able to go through, manage their holds. Holds is I think one of the key elements of, of um, the circulation impacts to our construction project. And uh, we've begun our communication process uh, just this last uh, week or so um, to communicate these changes to the public. Um, so all this information is basically up on the website right now. Um, just a reminder for everyone, the library did vote to go fine free last year. Uh, so there are no, um, I guess, financial impacts or fines that would be imposed for any overdue materials. In fact, we're taking that one step further and beginning here um, pretty shortly, we're gonna be making um, sure that no items become due between August 14 and September 10. Um, so uh, kudos to our circulation team for all of their planning and putting together all this documentation um, to help the public to be able to better manage their accounts during that two week time frame. Um, as I said before, the book drops will be closed. Um, the parking lot is gonna be closed obviously. So um, those types of remote services will not be available, but other remote services will. Our programming and um, our, our reference desk type uh, services will still remain available. Uh, throughout the course of that two week time frame. Um, that's kind of a, a, a net summary of what um, the capital project status is right now and what we've got planned for the closure coming up in August. Um, do you all have any questions about that information? What's been the response from some of the patrons? 
Well, yeah, obviously, you know, the first question is, my goodness, you're closing again? Um, obviously, this can't be COVID related. So we begin to explain, you know, what the, what the deal is with the electrical work that needs to be done and how impactful that is. Um, not everyone is going to understand because they're not as close to the, to the details. They haven't pulled apart the ceiling tiles to see just what the condition of the building is. Um, but uh, I think by and large, most folks understand that it's a physical building. It has to be maintained. And um, when we communicate that this is typically a quiet time for the library, um, I think folks mostly understand, well, I don't like it, but I guess I understand that this is the way it's going to have to be. Um, so we really encourage folks to stock up. Um, if you are going to still be in the area or if you're planning a vacation and you're going to need library resources over those two weeks, I want to encourage folks to come into the library and collect their materials there at the first part of August and uh, stock up and get things that can carry you through those two weeks. Thank you. But I've noticed, um, Anthony, that I, I think that's a, a great uh, uh, connection, synergy to use other libraries. So someone could go to Winnetka or Winnetka Northfield. And I hope that patrons understand that things are still available. My dog is um, bothering me. So that's my comment. Excuse me. <laughs> cool. Okay. Any other questions regarding the closure? You ready to switch to your director's report? Certainly. Um, I've got a few highlights I can, I can point out from the report and I'll try to be brief about that um, in the event that you might have some additional questions for me. So um, you'll see that we have, we've adopted a new service model when you first come into the library. Um, this may be familiar to folks who've, been, who've used the library um, pre-2016. Um, we did have a model where we did uh, a welcome desk when you first came in uh, to the building where you would be greeted by uh, one of our staff. As you know, um, uh, we, in the last year have had a greeter inside the vestibule um, who was helping to maintain our service model, um, keeping folks in their masks and so on. Um, since that requirement was relaxed um, just to our youth services area, uh, we've been able to um, introduce this new model, largely due in part to the fact that this construction project on the lower level has forced us to once again relocate our switchboard. So we decided to try a service model that we had done historically. And so far, the feedback to that service model with the welcome desk has been really positive. And a lot of folks are making a point of connecting with uh, the staff that are, that are at that welcome desk when they first come in the building. It's a great opportunity for us to be able to communicate directly about what's, what's happening inside the library. And um, uh, that, that staff is doing a fantastic job of explaining what's going on with this project, what we're talking about here, what our service model is, and addressing any other questions that folks may have about the library and our services right now. So, um, so far, it's been a really good experiment. And um, if we decide to maintain this for a period of time, I think we might update the furnishings that we have there. Um, right now, it's just kind of a temporary model for us. If we like it, we'll kind of, we'll double down on that. And if we really like it, uh, when we get to the point of looking at the renovation in 2024, um, we'll plan accordingly and actually create a, a more substantial space to, um, to provide that welcome desk in that area. Um, a couple other updates for you here. Um, we're in the middle of our website redesign project, um, quite frankly, the middle of it. Um, we're, we're right in the home stretch where the, where the library staff is making some of their key final decisions about uh, the layout of a number of pages. And um, we're going to have a, a demo and a feedback session available uh, regarding the website uh, beginning in early September with our continued um, uh, launch of the site due in mid-September. Um, the August time frame is really dedicated for our contractor library market to, to load a lot of the content from the existing website into the new website. So that's going to be a time for the contractors and staff to be doing a, a large part of the migration of our data. Um, some statistical information in the report, you can see that we've got continued strong circulation of our digital materials again this month, and physical circulation is obviously continuing to be really strong. I've noted that um, our door counts have actually um, are getting back to about where they were historically, which is really quite remarkable given uh, the state of the world right now. Um, we are right now in the process of compiling all of our annual statistics for the Illinois Public Library Annual Report, aka IPLAR. Uh, that will be on the August agenda for your review and approval. Um, so you'll see a lot more about the statistics um, at that time. Uh, staff is still compiling all that information right now. 
Um, but really interesting to see um, just how strong the performance has been and how well the public has responded to our services despite what an unusual year it has been. Um, some other interesting circulation um, statistics were provided in our report. Um, I, I like this, this chart that shows that 80 plus percent of our, of our materials um, that we circulate to Wilmette patrons come from Wilmette Library. Um, once again, continuing that 80-20 that rule. Um, you can see that our holds are increasing um, and that while our holds are really increasing and the space that we've allocated for them, um, as folks become more comfortable with coming into the building, our parking lot pickup service is actually trending downward and we're having fewer appointments for that service. Um, we'll continue to study that as the variant kind of continues to make its way forward. Um, Great, great data coming off of our self-checkout units, um, noting that um, about 40% of our total circulation is coming off of those uh, self-checkout units that we've installed in the last year. So patrons are really taking to that service model, and I think a lot of folks are choosing to check out their holds that way. Um, it's nice to have that option. Um, and uh, the overwhelming majority of the folks who are using the self-checkouts are actually using the two units that are up in the youth services department. We know that kids really like to check out their own materials and like to do it with those devices. Um, really, okay, so shifting there a little bit, um, the RFID project. I am thrilled to report that our RFID team has essentially completed their project. Uh, the remaining portion of our project um, is really just the compact disc collection and what we're doing with the jewel cases, which is an incredibly laborious process right now. We're busting out all the old jewel cases and putting them in some vinyl sleeves. Um, it is it is a tremendous labor to do all this work, but the result is beautiful and it's going to create a lot more shelf space and make that collection a lot more accessible. And it really, it refreshes the, the collection and makes it look really sharp. Um, kudos to that entire team for what they've done. Um, our, our RFID project, I, as I reported in, uh, in my report, um, they worked so hard. They were doing it um, upwards of 12 hours a day, um, even when we had our reduced uh, hours sailing through the collection, becoming deeply familiar with handling every single item of our collection. Um, you know, over a quarter million items were individually handled, tagged, inventoried. Um, it, it's been a wonderful project for us. We're really thrilled about it. And we're really excited to be able to turn on the RFID system at these self-checkout units so that patrons can start taking advantage of the benefit of that contact list um, and not having to search for the barcodes and all their items uh, with that system. Uh, circulation staff are currently experimenting with it. They've got their unit set up at the circulation desk to help facilitate checkout. And that seems to be going really well. We're working out some of the kinks and uh, we should have this whole system up and ready to roll here soon. Um, I think, you know, with, with the closure coming up, um, it's a lot of services to have to introduce all at once with, and with our communications. We're, we're kind of, we're biding our time with how we're gonna roll, do that rollout of communication. So stay tuned, um, we'll have more information for you at our next meeting about that. Um, our big program of the year, our summer reading clubs are in full swing. Um, a lot of information about that in the packet and on the website, I won't go into too much detail about that here. Uh, we kicked off on June 1 and we continue this year through September 4th. Um, we will be resuming a print newsletter beginning in September, so stay tuned. You'll find that in your mailboxes. And then the last aspect of my director's report is just reflecting the fact that um, we got a lot of vacancies. Now we're still trying to post a number of positions um, and uh, get those all filled uh, so that we can continue to, to, um, to provide all the services that we do. So it is a very busy time for us here on the back end. And I'm happy to take any questions that you may have about anything that's in my report. My only comment is, uh, oh, sorry, sorry. I love the welcome desk. I have been in, I think it's a great addition. I think it's really nice. Thank you. How have Sunday hours gone thus far? I think it's been only two, two Sundays that you've been open. Yeah, so we started on, um, that was the 11th uh, was our first one. Um, folks are still getting used to the Sunday traffic um, or the Sunday hours, but um, I, uh, anecdotal feedback that I've had so far is it's great to be back to our regular, to the regular schedule and to have full seven days of service. 
So I think statistical trending will need to ferret out a little bit more as folks become more familiar with the schedule. Thank you. Any other questions? Do you have any idea why it's been difficult to, to get new staff? Um, this, this could be a very long conversation. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't have, a, um, you know, a crystal ball yeah. to really explain all of the, all the detail related to that. Um, okay. it's a highly competitive market right now. Um, if you go to the rails jobs list, you will see that, um, there have never been so many jobs posted in this industry right now. Um, mm -hmm. so it's highly competitive. There are a lot of jobs out there. Um, but uh, also not a lot of full-time jobs. And um, a lot of folks are putting together multiple part-time jobs still. Um, and there may be some other you know, market-related issues as well related to um, either unemployment compensation or other details um, that we can't really put our finger on. But I'm, not, I'm obviously not a financial analyst or a market analyst when it comes to HR. I can't really tell you exactly. But um, you know, the other detail for the library is that um, we, we're kind of faced with an opportunity here for us to evaluate the way that our staffing model and structure has been set up. This is the first time that we've seen this kind of turnover in so, and, and in such key positions. Right. And we're also conducting a simultaneous review of all of our job descriptions and um, our compensation structure. So this has given us an opportunity to um, press pause and not just rinse and repeat and do the exact thing that we've done year over year when we've had a vacancy. Uh, this mm -hmm. gives us an opportunity to really delve into the details and make sure that whatever positions we're posting are positions that we've uh, we've studied, that we know that we actually need. And if we need to refine some of the duties and responsibilities or make any changes, this is a great time for us to take that, you know, that time to study it. So uh, that's we're we're kind of, you know, we're, it's it's a it's kind of a two-headed monster right now that we're trying to face. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. You well. Thank you. Uh, let's move to the committee reports. Uh, Trustee Fishman is going to briefly report on the Community Connections Committee, chaired by Trustee Nealon. Thank you. Uh, very briefly, uh, the committee met, and it, it was um, delightful to see that the entire board attended the uh, Community Connection Committee. So um, then. Uh, we approve the minutes from the November 11th, 2019, the last meeting um, of the uh, of the uh, a diff a different named committee, but we approve those minutes. And now all we can say is that we are moving forward, ongoing with exploration of our committee's charge. So nothing has been set in stone and we're still discussing and um, looking into uh, what we feel that we need to do and want to do with fu at future meetings. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jan, do you have anything to the ILA? ILA? <laughs> sure. Uh, just a reminder that the ILA conference will be held virtually October 12th to 14th. Keynote speaker is award-winning author Clint Smith and the first 190 people to register will receive a free copy of his book, How the Word is Passed, A Reckoning with the History of Slavery Across America. It's been a New York Times bestseller. You can register on the ILA website. Second thing is that um, there are now post-pandemic grants for libraries bouncing back from the pandemic, developing resources for the local workforce. Uh, $5,000 to $50,000 to spend on the library's empl employment related resources. The next thing is that they're expanding digital inclusion, transforming library services, some $5,000 to $30,000, expanding digital resources like circulating internet hotspots and laptops to help targeted groups of patrons recover from the pandemic. And lastly, something called On the Road to Recovery, transforming, transforming library spaces, 5,000 to 25,000 to help public libraries restore the library's capacity to operate and create clean, safe spaces in the library after reopening. 
So a lot of things to think about. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anthony, do you have anything with rails? Um, no, I have not, no updates. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And just a note, uh, there are no information items. We're switching to that. There are no communications or suggestions from the suggestion box or emails that it's been a slow email month from some of the community. Uh, as a requirement for the Illinois Public Library annual report that um, Anthony mentioned earlier that we will approve at the next meeting, the board minutes secretaries, which consists of trustees O'Keefe and Elam, uh, are required to review the minutes of the WPLD of Libraries Board of Trustee meetings for fiscal year 2021 prior to the August meeting. Since we will be meeting, since the library will be closing, you might want to do it probably if M Marty has them, uh, you know, contact Marty first to let her know you're coming. And generally it takes probably, go on, let, go on. All right, so um, there are a couple little details we need to take care of first. In order for the Secretary's Audit Committee to complete um, their work, we need some signatures. So there's a few outstanding sets of minutes that will require some signatures. Um, that includes um, the minutes of a finance committee meeting. Um, I think I'm gonna need the secretary, the president and the treasurer to sign a couple documents first. So let us compile that list of the do documents that have the outstanding um, signatures required. And once we have that, uh, those details completed, we'll notify the, um, the committee that they can come in and complete their review. When will you be ready for the, for us to come by? I, I think probably uh, next week it would be reasonable. Okay, thank you. I'm not gonna be in town until the 16th of August. Can, so I won't be able to sign for them. Okay. You're going next week too. Yeah, I'm going next week, but. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll we'll try to capture at least Jan before she's gone, and um, Tracy will will work through the details. Okay. And this is just a note that our next meeting will be August seventeenth at six thirty at the Wilmette Village Hall. We will be there in person, and uh, at six thirty we'll have the BNA meeting for the public to make their comments, and we will start at six thirty. And that's, they will be the first thing on board and then the meeting will continue. I think it's gonna be on the second floor in the room that they usually have, but more details will yeah. be posted. Council Chambers gotcha. is the, the room. Um, and um, yeah, our first in-person meeting, um, as I said at the top of the call, although I think that was before the recording, um, the governor's um, executive order that allows us to meet remotely uh, will expire on July 24 will not be renewed, and that is why we need to meet in person. But our August 17 meeting happens to coincide with the closure of the library, so we can't meet here, which is why we're meeting at Village Hall, um, thanks to the village manager for setting us up in that space. Thank you. And uh, when we start go forward, we will be meeting downstairs in the main auditorium, as opposed to up in the staff lounge. So that'll be another change. So are there, is there, are there any questions, any additional new business anybody would like to bring up? Okay. Hearing none, can we have a, a move that the board adjourn this meeting? I move that the board adjourn this meeting at yeah. six, I'm sorry, 823. Is there a second? Oh, second. <laughs> okay, it's been moved and seconded by, it's been moved by Trustee Fishman, seconded by Trustee Barshis at 823 that the uh, we adjourn the meeting. And that can be all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Meeting adjourned. Have a Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm.